let me welcome you to the um, final What Physicists Do talk of the semester. Those of you in 494, we have other meetings for the semester. We have two more meetings, but this is the final public talk of the semester. So I was like, uh, it's a little bit of a milestone to, to reach the end of another semester in the proud storied history of what physicists do. Dr. Ten isn't here for me to say that. <laughs> I'm really pleased that we have Dr. Ming Yi. Um, she is a, a very newly minted assistant professor at Rice University. Um, she received her PhD in physics at MIT and completed her PhD at Stanford. She was then a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley. She was recently honored with the Spicer Young Investigator Award for her significant contributions to the Stanford synchrotron radiation light source. We are very fortunate to welcome Dr. Yi before um, she begins her, her, her position now at Rice University. Let's please give a warm welcome to Dr. Yi. Yi. Thank you so very much uh, for, for the kind introduction and thank you all for uh, being here today and given everything we have going on in the Bay Area, I really appreciate your presence. So today, uh, my job here today is to show you a little bit about research we, we have done on high temperature superconductors. Basically, why they're interesting, what we hope to achieve with these materials, um, and how we actually do experiments on these materials to find out you know, the really interesting physics that actually goes on in these materials. So without further ado, let me start by introducing uh, superconductors. So, let's see how this works. Okay, sorry. Do this. Okay, so uh, maybe perhaps some of you have seen uh, superconductors being this thing that usually floats on top of a magnet and it can rotate and do all kinds of really crazy stuff. So superconductors are materials with, with really interesting properties and it has already been used in uh, very uh, different kinds of applications in our daily lives. For example, uh, superconductors can are able to uh, create a large magnetic field in uh, coils of wire. Therefore, uh, it's been used as a superconducting magnet uh, from, sorry. Uh, sorry, this is just died. Okay. If you don't mind, we have another one. Thank maybe, you. maybe we can do this. So Thank you, sorry. Put that in and then. Okay, laser, the laser is the top great. and then forward and left. Don't hit the Thank bottom. You. Thank sure. you. Sure. So, um, Apologize for that. Uh, so uh, these are just some of the applications that's already been used uh, using superconductors. For example, superconducting magnets has been used in uh, magnetic resonance imaging devices, and it's also been used in fundamental research like in uh, particle accelerators um, and high energy physics. And also, superconductors are known to be very efficient at transmitting power uh, using power transmission lines. And also, uh, it's been used in these so-called maglev trains, where you can have trains actually traveling where floating on top of the tracks without touching the tracks. And you can imagine with these kind of applications, you can achieve at great speeds because essentially you're not limited by the contact <coughs> resistance. So these are just really interesting properties that people have already made use of superconductors, but why does it do that? Um, so fundamentally, there are actually two uh, shall I say macroscopic properties that define a superconductor. One is that um, in the superconducting state, which just happens below a certain temperature, the electrical resistance suddenly drops to zero. So when a material is a superconductor, there is no resistance at all. So when you have a piece of wire, uh, in a normal wire, the wire will get hot um, you know, with, with uh, higher, higher currents, but for a superconductor, uh, it does not get hot because there's no resistance. And then the second uh, property is that inside a superconductor, for example this one, uh, it expels all of the magnetic field. So this is actually the basic reason for why superconductors are used to levitate stuff. Uh, basically when you put a piece of superconductor on top of a magnet, it repels the magnetic field from the magnet, therefore counteracting the force of gravity so you can levitate stuff, which is pretty magical to look at. Because of these two properties, uh, as I sort of alluded to, you have this kind of applications. And just to give you a sense of uh, how magical that is, imagine uh, when you have uh, uh, wires for transmitting power, it takes much less 
uh, material for if you use sparkling wire to transmit the same kind of power as you would with traditional copper wires, right? So, and then secondly, uh, you can imagine if you can have trains that travel uh, on top of tracks without touching them, uh, you can achieve really high speed. So I think the record is uh, currently, last time I checked, uh, the tra these trains can actually achieve uh, on the order of 374 miles per hour. And um, so it, uh, when you have this kind of uh, tra uh, travel, whatever uh, the limiting factor is really like air resistance, right? So you can imagine if you can actually build these tunnels, which some people have actually done, and suck out part of the, part of the air in these tunnels, you can actually theoretically reach really, really high speeds. So like some, some, something on order of 18, 100 miles per hour, and you know, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> using the same amount of uh, uh, commute time of an hour and a half that many of us actually have to endure and live in the Bay Area, you can actually cover the distance from San Francisco to New York. So you can imagine having these kind of applications can dramatically change our lives. So uh, we can only start daydream the kind of world we would live in if we had uh, these uh, superconductors being made into these very useful applications. So. So what is the problem? Well, first of all, I just want to make a point that uh, superconductors are actually not that rare. Uh, not, they're more common than we, uh, than, we, uh, than we think. So if you look, take a look on the periodic table, actually most of the elements on this table are superconductors in one way or another. Uh, you can see all the colored ones. The blue ones and the green one elements are all uh, superconductors <coughs> under some uh, parameter regime. So why don't we see them more often than we do? There's one tiny problem, which is that um, these materials really only go into the superconducting state if we cool them down below a temperature. This is the critical temperature called Tc. And for most of these elements, Tc is really low. It's on, only on the order of a few degrees above absolute zero. So you can imagine, in order to take advantage of these really interesting properties, we actually need to spend a lot of money on cooling, uh, on cooling these materials down to that low temperature. And that is really co costly. So this is why in terms of uh, applications, if we only have superconductors with these really low TC, then it's not really uh, feasible to make them into applications. So you can imagine in the field of superconductors, our goal is really to find uh, materials that can superconduct at very high temperatures, so at least a uh, higher temperature than a few kelvins, or even perhaps the goal is to reach room temperature superconductivity. So you can, you, you, you can imagine if we have materials that can do these amazing things at room temperature, then drastically changes our, you know, our technologies today. So how do we actually go about doing that? Um, I can then show you maybe, oh, I forgot to say, please interrupt me anytime uh, that you have a question. I really hope this will be more interactive than, um, <laughs> than me rambling on. Um, yeah. Uh, so let me first show you uh, how we have fared so far in looking for materials that superconduct. Basically, like a brief outline uh, of what kind of materials have been found <coughs> to be superconductors. So here I try to show you a plot where the vertical axis is this transition temperature Tc, and then the horizontal axis is like the year that various materials uh, were discovered. And the very first one um, was discovered in 1911 by this gentleman, uh, Cameron Onis, uh, who was the very first one who would, to be able to, to liquefy helium. So you know helium in our, you know, uh, in our daily living, it, it appears in terms of a, of a gas, but he was the only one that figured out how to actually make it into a liquid. And when he did that, he was able to achieve really low temperatures, uh, four kelvins above absolute zero. So when he did that, he sort of started putting materials uh, at that really low temperature, and lo and behold, what he found was that when he put mercury to that really low temperature, its resistivity dropped to zero all of a sudden. That was really shocking to many of them, uh, many physicists at that time that a material will actually lose all of its resist electrical resistance below a certain temperature. And that became known as the, this, uh, this phenomena of superconductivity. So, um, and then in the next couple of decades following that first discovery, um, there were various of materials that were found to be uh, superconductors, but um, unfortunately their TC all hugged 
relatively close to absolute zero temperature. So this axis is in the units of uh, Kelvin, which is uh, measured from the absolute zero. And then um, about uh, in the 1950s, uh, it, took, uh, it took the physicists many years to actually figure out what is actually happening in these materials, what is actually making these materials have these really interesting properties. And it, it took these three gentlemen uh, in the year 1950s to come out with a theory which was then named after them. So these are uh, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schieffer. So the theory was named after them, uh, their initial species of theory. And they figured out what was actually making these materials super nuts. Basically, if you actually look, uh, really uh, zoomed in on these materials, what you realize is that uh, if you imagine these are lattices, there are electrons that flow in these materials. You know that, as I'm sure you have learned in physics classes, that, that fundament, one of the fundamental particles are electrons which uh, appear in these uh, materials. And what they found was that in these superconductors, what happens is that uh, instead of flowing freely, uh, the electrons on the, in these materials actually pair up. So two electrons are bound together, two electrons are bound together, and they became known as the Cooper pairs. And um, so what happens is that when these electrons are bound together, it takes a lot of energy to break them apart. So they're sort of protected from scattering uh, as they travel through the lattice. And because of that uh, b binding of these electrons, this is why they can actually uh, flow through the material without being scattered. Therefore, uh, the material reaching zero resistance, electrical resistance. This is why you, if you put a voltage across the material, these uh, superconductors will, will conduct electrical uh, uh, currents without losing any energy to resist resistance. Right, so this, this is a fundamental uh, piece of uh, really important information <coughs> for why these materials are actually uh, superconducting. It's because of these uh, binding of uh, electrons into pairs. And they also figured out the reason why these electrons actually bind together it's because they interact with the lattice. So what do I mean by that? You can imagine intuitively in this picture, uh, electrons are negatively charged, right? <coughs> so when electrons travel through, uh, it's, ne it's negatively charged of, uh, uh, property sort of attracts the underlying lattice and locally makes the lattice a little, just a tiny bit positive there. And this uh, local positive uh, net charge then in turn attracts the second electron. So by interacting with the lattice, these electrons are actually bounded together. So uh, the reason for these pairs, for these pairs to form, is that these the electrons, oh, sorry, these electrons are uh, interacting with the lattice. So this uh, became known as electron phonon coupling, which sort of provides, you can think about it as, a, as kind of a glue that binds these electrons together in these superconductors. So th they figured this out, and it was really amazing that explained all of these phenomena. But there was one problem which is that according to their theory, the highest TC you can achieve in these materials is very low. So in their in the theory, uh, the, the kind of interaction this provides can only give you materials that, that can have at most a TC you know, below 40 Kelvin. That's a bummer, right, for, 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 for applications because, because it takes a lot of cooling power to make these materials have these interesting properties that we want to use for applications. So what do we do? Well, luckily, in, the in 1986, uh, there was a surprise that shocked the whole field, uh, which is that uh, these two gentlemen, Bett Norris and Mueller, uh, discovered that, uh, it was an accidental discovery, that when they put a bunch of elements together into this compound, they found these materials that had really high transition temperatures, so high that um, they have exceeded this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, bottleneck uh, of liquid nitrogen temperature. So if you know liquid nitrogen is much cheaper than liquid helium. Uh, they are very abundant. You it's essentially free compared to liquid helium. So if you could have materials uh, you know, that become <coughs> superconducting uh, well above liquid nitrogen, then you can use liquid nitrogen to really cool these materials and then make them much, much more cost effective for application. So, there was a whole family of materials that were discovered during those couple of years. And uh, interestingly, they all had in common the element copper. Right? So these materials then became known as the cuprates for copper oxides. And um, the second problem is that, as I mentioned before, um, BCS theory only works up to materials that have a TC about this high. But these materials actually largely exceeded this theoretical limit. Why? 
nobody understands and nobody understands still. So I'm here to say that 30 years after the discovery of these materials, we are still in need of a theory that can explain why these materials can do these amazing things at much higher temperature. We still don't know. This is, yes, Scott. Yeah, oh, Dr. E, this is, this is fascinating. I love the timeline here. I, I just, if I may make it just a comment, I mean, you saw the discovery in 1913, right? <laughs> and then a model for the understanding of it coming place in the 50s and then being tested enough to win the Nobel Prize in the early 70s, yes, right? Yes. And so that historical perspective looks like, hey, we've got this new class yeah. happening in the, in the 80s, and now it seems more reasonable to say, like, no one has, like, come to understand why this is happening, right? right? There was this 50 year, 40, 50 year gap between discovering it and, and understanding it the first time around, right? Yeah, thank you, that's very encouraging to us. <laughs> that we are not really doing anything wrong, but perhaps uh, that we're close to, you know, finding a cure, I mean, uh, a theory for high TC. <laughs> right, uh, yes, thank you, yes. So, so we're, we're, as a field, we're actively working towards that goal is, uh, you can imagine if we want to find materials that have these high TC, we want to be able to predict what kind of materials actually can have these uh, properties of higher TC if we can first understand what actually makes these materials higher TC. So this is sort of the goal of our field is understand what's making these materials high, have high TC and then perhaps engineer or synthesize new materials that can optimize these properties. Now the problem is for, for 20 years actually, this was the only family of uh, so-called high TC uh, superconductors, so it was really hard to actually pin down what is the minimal ingredients, what is central to the phenomenon of high TC superconductivity. Until about a decade ago, so just as I entered graduate school in 2008, uh, this gentleman, uh, Professor Hosono in Japan, accidentally, again, accidentally discovered this uh, second class of materials that also had relatively high TC, and they all had in common uh, in red uh, iron, and uh, they became known as iron-based high-temperature superconductors. And so now it's where the view is really happy because now we actually have two kinds of materials, and we can sort of compare and contrast these two to actually figure out what is in common in these materials and, and whether that could actually tell us or push us towards the actual uh, discovery of high TC theory. So, uh, so we have been. Uh, so I have been mostly working on this materials uh, since I started graduate school, and this is sort of the goal of what I will tell you later in the talk. Uh, some of the things we have found about these kind of materials. But I also mentioned that uh, BCF theory works for these conventional superconductors. So these two families are actually became known as unconventional superconductors, basically because you know, we don't understand how they work. Conventional, unconventional because we don't understand them, uh, and uh, they do not, uh, they cannot be explained by the BCS theory. What makes them special? Why can't we understand them? Well, from the outside, if you just look at the superconductor material itself, it does not look very different from the conventional ones. It, it, it levitates above a magnet and it rotates and all that, and loses the electrical resistivity. But if you actually zoom in, uh, yes, and look at the atomic lattices, you, you again you will see that the electrons are actually bound, bound together into pairs. So this is, these, these gray ones are like the underlying lattice, and then you have the electrons that are sort of uh, associated bound to pairs. And in these convention, unconventional materials, the important thing is that the electrons themselves actually interact quite a lot. They interact with each other, so they form pairs, but we don't understand what kind of interactions are happening. So our goal is really to understand in these unconventional or so-called high temperature superconductors, what's making the electrons pair. You may ask, why would interactions uh, of these uh, electrons make the material any different uh, if, if, the material, if, the, if, if all you have are just electrons and atoms and it does not look any different from other materials, why do we even care about thinking about interactions? So here I want to uh, introduce the concept of emergence. So actually this is a very interesting concept. So if you think about uh, populations and societies, there are all kinds of social trends that arise, not because of individual uh, people, but really because of I mean, the way people interact uh, here and there. And you get really interesting social phenomena that, that occur. So this is actually a very general um, concept, which is called emergence. Basically, according to Wikipedia, emergence occurs when, you, when the whole together is greater than the sum of the parts 
basically occur, uh, emerges appears uh, that drives properties that really come about because of interactions among parts, not because of the parts themselves. Right. So these are some examples I think you, 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 we see in our society. For example, you know, people can spontaneously make waves, start a wave at a stadium, or you know, there, there are like election trends that just you know that, that arise, or there's natural separation of traffic flow. Well, all of these phenomena in our society sort of is an analogy to the kind of emergent phenomena that appear. So this is exactly why studying interactions uh, is important because. Uh, because because of interactions, actually uh, vastly different kinds of behaviors arise. So this is this is from a physics point of view. This is also something we want to understand. So um, so on atomic lattices, just like in our society, uh, there are all kinds of really interesting interactions uh, that drive uh, macroscopic material properties. So what are they? So if we imagine we're on atomic lattice and some some sort of crystal or materials, uh, you know, there are these so-called four uh, fundamental degrees of freedom that could drive any of these really interesting phenomena. So, one is lattice. So you can imagine you can have fun, fun, a fundamental lattice of a crystal. Uh, we have charge, which are like electrons or holes that are traveling in the material. And then, uh, if you learn quantum mechanics, these electrons also carry something called a spin. You can have spin up, spin down. So this is another property of the uh, uh, electrons. And then you may also learn quantum mechanics that uh, the electrons live in orbitals. So uh, different kind of orbitals that the electrons can occupy. So these four things are uh, what uh, we call the four fundamental uh, degrees of freedom because actually all kinds of amazing material properties arise because of these four things. That's it. So everything that we see, that the amazing properties that supermatters have arise because of these four fundamental degrees of freedom and they can uh, give rise to spontaneous orders that appear on atomic lattices. For example, uh, if you look locally, you may see sometimes in some materials that there is a density wave, basically a wave in the amount of charge that you have. If you go, you know, go, if you look, measure along the material uh, uh, crystal axis, you can also have some sort of wave uh, that really uh, tells you there's a pattern, the spin directions, for example, uh, you can think about perhaps the occupation of, of the electrons in orbitals could also have some sort of uh, uh, watering, uh, or you can have some sort of also lattice distortion uh, because of uh, lowering energy in, in certain sort of uh, symmetry breaking states. Anyway, so so these are some examples to show you that it's really important to in order to understand these emergent phenomena in superconductors. It's really an, important to understand try to study uh, how these four fundamental degrees of freedom are actually driving these material properties at, from a fundamental level. Yes. Yeah, and Dr. Yi, the, yeah. um, the hardest one, let me just yeah. talk about the lattice and the Jan Teller distortion. Okay. Maybe it's not the hardest, but when I, when I look on it, I'm less familiar with that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, maybe not to the chemists here, right? But, <laughs> but um, so is that is that saying sort of distortions in the arrangement and sort of distances between atoms in the material? Uh -huh. Is that not charge related? Is it, or is it is it? It seems like it might come from the other things, like the orbitals might set up why it squeezes in one direction to another direction. So I'm wondering whether that one is its own yeah. property or whether it's kind of the way the atoms arrange themselves because of charge density yeah. or orbital order? I guess that's my question of it. This is a great question. Thank you, Scott. So I mean, this way, I sort of uh, try to uh, say uh, sort of the way I drew this is kind of like, this is only driven by this, this is driven by this. But in reality, all of these really fantastic emergent orders arise because multiple degrees of freedom could be at play. So it could be a comp So any of these phenomena, uh, even though that's a microscopic uh, manifestation, but it could be driven by, you know, oh, sorry, uh, multiple, more than one uh, degrees of freedom. And it's because of this interaction of degrees of freedom that can give rise to more exotic phenomena. So, so I'm, yeah, so you're, you're correct. So uh, many, most, actually most emergent orders appear not because of one fundamental degrees of freedom, but because of multiple uh, interactions of these uh, multiple degrees of freedom. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so that that brings me to the question: is How do we actually study these uh, things? They seem very abstract, right? We can't see them. You know, they appear at very tiny things inside the crystals. How do we actually study them? 
So in order to think about this, I guess uh, one, uh, one initial uh, key point I want to uh, state is that it's not enough to just know where the electrons are. It's not enough to just know the location of the electrons. Actually, we also have to know what is the velocity of the electrons to really understand these materials. So uh, location, if you think about it, is like real space of where things are, right? And velocity, in a way, is like knowing the momentum of these electrons. So you can actually, instead of mapping things out in real space, we also have to consider you know, mapping things out in so-called momentum space. So let me sort of introduce, uh, introduce a little bit about momentum space, because this is not something that we usually think about when we in real life. In real life, we just think about real space. But actually, I'm going to show you, uh, if you th start thinking about electrons in momentum space, there's a lot more information that we can actually gather uh, from these materials. So what is momentum space? Um, if you think about uh, simple uh, like particles, like um, think about mechanics, basically. Uh, if you have a bunch of you know, uh, electron gas, basically electrons that are just you know, like a gas. And if you think about their energy in terms of momentum, basically in mechanics you learn that energy of these particles is essentially proportional to uh, momentum squared. Right? Um, so if you map out, if you sort of plot energy uh, versus uh, momentum, uh, in this case it's called K, uh, you would see some sort of par par parabola like that. This is the relation of just, you know, just individual particles, right? Now imagine you start putting these electrons on a crystal. So crystals, what do the crystals have? They have the lattice. Crystals have you know, a uh, periodic uh, repeat, uh, repetition of, uh, of, of lattices. So there's a periodicity um, now, uh, which imposes sort of like a periodic potential on these electrons. So these electrons now start to feel like different uh, from here to here. But it, it feels the same at this point and this point and this point. So this periodicity, uh, which uh, uh, appears on the crystal lattice, uh, actually forces the electrons to have a energy versus momentum of relation that also, that also reflects this periodicity. So basically, you can think about when electrons uh, travel on a crystal lattice, this relation gets modified such that it also becomes periodic. And it happens in such a way that you sort of backfill this line and such that you know here, this part and this part are the same, right? Uh, so you get these squiggly lines. So what? I mean, what, what, are, what are these? So basically, you can think of these lines as um, energy states that these electrons can live in a solid. So basically, given any, any momentum point, uh, it tells you exactly what energies uh, these elec electrons can live in. It cannot be randomly anywhere. It's the energy versus momentum relation is dictated by these lines, right? And this is called a um, band dispersion. So these are these uh, spaghetti plots. Sometimes we call them spaghetti plots. Uh, they're called band dispersions. But you say, okay, fine. Your band dispersions. Um, they're so abstract. What do I care about? Why do I care about band dispersions? Actually, yes. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just a yeah. quick question. So if the crystal structure repeats in this lattice, yeah. um, on your momentum, it looks like the the two waveforms are at, at different phases. Um, the one, uh, it has the statement on it right now, energy states. But, oh. Um, yeah, so oh, the two waves there are, are different phases, right? Yeah, if, yeah. If the you, you mean like uh, from here to here versus from here to here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the one below it is just shifted over a little yeah. bit. Um, if, the, if the lattice is repetitive, um, how, how does that? Oh, happen? great question. So, so the periodicity here would be from here to here. This would be a full period in this case. And then it repeats from here. This point will be the same as this point. So it repeats. This is the full period, and then the next full period. Yeah. May I? I think to to expand on James's question. Uh -huh. I think it would help him to understand. If, if I'm reading that right, because the energy level has those gray bars, yeah. we're saying at the bottom that's the kind of momentums that electrons that are what bound to the the lattice atoms have. Are we looking at band gaps, and therefore are we looking at free electrons? Oh, this is yeah. This is a great question. So I'm actually talk about that on the next slide, uh, like what uh, these bands actually mean. So right. So uh, I'm going to talk about that. Okay. And so just to follow up on James's question, yeah. he was kind of asking, hey, if I look at that, I look at one of them, and rather than talking about it being out of phase, just yeah. looking at one and say, at this 
at the lower line, the lower spaghetti squiggle, uh -huh. Uh -huh. there's a lot of electrons, or there's a lot of, um, yeah, that's not en that's energy. There's a yeah. lot of energy for an electron with that momentum. Uh -huh. And then there's this other one where there's a low, it's a low point in the energy uh -huh. for that electron. Uh -huh. So I think that's what he wants to get an understanding of by the time you get another slide or two in, okay. if you could. Okay. Maybe let me go over the next slide, then we can you, uh, yeah, then, sure. then we can uh, uh, come back to this question. If you ask that again, <laughs> yeah. So so um, right. So if we zoom in on this uh, spaghetti plot, uh, actually there's a very useful. I'm going to show you how this actually connects with microscopic properties, <laughs> like what makes a material a conductor, what makes an insulator, and how can we read that off from just by looking at these spaghetti plots, basically. Why do I care? Like, why is some, some material a good conductor like copper, while some materials are not? So basically, uh, let me first introduce this uh, concept, which is called a Fermi level. Basically, it's a constant, uh, it's a level, uh, energy level, uh, at below which uh, all the, these electronic states are filled by absolute zero temperature. So you can imagine the material, if you cool it down to absolute zero temperature, all of these states are filled with the electrons. All of these states above it are empty. Uh, that's what's defined by an energy level. Uh, Fermi, Fermi level. Fermi level basically marks uh, marks the boundary between filled states and uh, and unfilled states. So basically, all of these states will be filled by electrons, and these will be empty. Now, if this Fermi level for a material like copper happens to lie across uh, crosses these bands, uh, namely it crosses yeah these spaghetti bands then actually it takes very, very little energy to excite an electron from a filled state to an unfilled state. And this, these electrons then will be free to move. Uh, so this actually, if a Fermi level happens across band, uh, uh, energy bands, then this, these materials are actually good conductors. But uh, if this Fermi level for material actually happens to be in these gray areas uh, where, you know, um, it's some way away from the bands available uh, uh, electronic states. Then you can imagine only these bands are filled, these electronic states are filled, and these are actually unfilled. So in order for these electrons to jump across the so-called gap, it needs a finite amount of energy to go from filled state to unfilled states. So these materials then are not very good conductors. So if you apply a small voltage, it's really hard for the electrons to move because all these bands are actually filled and they cannot uh, really, uh, they, can, they cannot move to these uh, empty states uh, 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 without overcoming this barrier, this is so-called a gap. I don't know if that's, uh, what? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I, can, I can ask you after yeah. the talk. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so, so you can s see that just by sort of looking at um, these uh, band dispersions of these materials, we can actually know you know, many interesting properties of material, like whether, whether it's a good conductor or not, whether it's, a, or whether it's actually an insulator. So actually all of these uh, microscopic material properties are, you know, written in in these band dispersions, which are like fingerprints of different solid, solid materials. So any solid material has a set of these, uh, these uh, band dispersions. They're really like fingerprints that tells us about how electrons are actually behaving in these materials. So if we can sort of get insights into these uh, so-called band dispersions of any material, then we can actually learn a lot about what makes these materials, you know, a good superconductor or a good uh, conductor or insulator and so on and so forth, right? So we need to find a way to actually measure experimentally uh, these band dispersions uh, for various different kinds of material. How do we do that? Now I come to our technique, which is uh, called angle resolve photo emission spectroscopy, or short RPES. And uh, this is actually based on this uh, effect uh, called the photoelectric effect. So actually, this is the thing that um, Einstein won his Nobel Prize for, uh, actually. So um, basically, it's a very simple phenomenon. So you can imagine if you shine, if you shine light, basically, if you shine photons onto like a piece of metal, if this energy of these photons are big enough, right, if it can overcome the work function of this material, then it's basically donating uh, energy uh, packets onto these electrons. And if this energy is big enough, then these electrons in the material can actually get kicked out into vacuum. Very simple phenomenon. 
So you, you, you donate a bunch of uh, energy from these photons onto this material, and if this energy is, uh, is high enough, then electrons get kicked out. This is a very straightforward phenomenon, so, uh, uh, which is the basic underlying uh, uh, technique for this, uh, for this RPS thing. In, re in practice, what, what we do is uh, we go to one of these uh, gigantic national facilities called a synchrotron. Uh, basically, in a synchrotron, uh, you can have really highly accelerated uh, 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 electrons in this ring. And as you know, sorry, in this way. And as you know, when charges accelerate, uh, they give off light radiation, basically. So if you accelerate these electrons uh, in this fashion, then anywhere along this path, you will give off uh, radiation or light. And we can actually use that light to, to do uh, science. So basically, we harvest this light in one of these branch lines or beam lines, and we shine this light onto our, uh, the material we want to study, basically. And as we said, according to the photoelectric effect, then this light will kick out electrons into vacuum, into, into the space above the sample. And then we have this uh, very gigantic, uh, not very big, kind of this big, uh, detectors called electron analyzers that sort of absorb these, catch these electrons that fly out into space. And the, its function is to measure the energy and momentum of these electrons. So all it does is it measures the, uh, the, the, the energy and momentum of the electrons that fly out into space from this material. And um, luckily we have conservation of energy and momentum in this process. In the process in which electrons are kicked out, the energy and momentum are conserved. So by measuring the final energy and momentum of these uh, photoelectrons, we can sort of back out the original energy and momentum information of these electrons before they were kicked out. Basically, what were the energy and momentum information of these electrons when they were you know, still traveling happily in the material? And this is actually exactly what band dispersions are. It's a plot of energy versus momentum. So basically, this technique actually lets us directly image these uh, so-called band dispersions or spaghetti plots. We can sort of directly see these plots on our uh, uh, detectors. And we can then understand what are the allowed states of these electrons in certain materials uh, and study what makes them interesting. So just to show you some interesting plots that we make, uh, so imagine if we have a very simple energy uh, relation, you know, energy versus momentum along a thousand directions. Suppose, uh, you know, this is a fake one. Suppose we have a parabolic uh, band, then we would actually take images like a cut across this, uh, across this space. And we would actually observe a energy versus momentum uh, image like this. You know, it's, it's a parabolic band uh, in this uh, example. And you can imagine if we actually take a bunch, a series of parallel cuts across this, then we can get a whole cube of information from which we can reconstruct any kind of plane we want. And another useful one is actually an, a constant energy control like this, or, or a horizontal cut. So in this kind of plot, we will have a, a momentum a KY and momentum KX along a thousand directions. And if you actually do this at the special energy of a Fermi level that we introduced earlier, this is actually a direct uh, image of the so-called Fermi surface of a material. Right? And just, just to flash you, this is actually a real measurement. So this is the RPS uh, measurement of a copper uh, surface state. And you can see uh, beautifully directly that this is a parabolic band. So very, I don't know, sometimes I still stop and think about this. We're actually directly imaging what are the allowed electronic states uh, in, in any kind of materials that we want by just directly measuring the electrons that come out of the material that you can see that electrons actually do travel in these, uh, in these very beautiful band dispersions in all kinds of uh, crystalline materials that we have. So this is a simple one because the surface states, of course, if you have some sort of compound with um, multiple elements, you get more complex uh, band dispersions. So basically, if you follow the color, white color on this plot, those are the energy states that are allowed at any given uh, momentum points. And then, uh, according, uh, and then if you have a complicated uh, band dispersions, you can also actually image these really beautiful symmetric so-called Fermi surfaces of these materials. And um, they're just, I don't know, when I first started this business, this was the thing that actually drew me to this technique because it's just, you just see that right in front of your eyes on the computer screen that you get these really beautiful images uh, that actually tell you what's actually going on uh, in these materials uh, at an atomic level. Yes. Dr. Mingyi, I'm going to um, walk through a way of thinking about the Fermi surface, but correct me because I'm just, you know. Um, 
when you do this, you know, you're bombarding it with that, that light source from the synchrotron. Yeah. You give it energy, and then you're measuring where it comes out and how fast it's coming out. Yeah. So that bottom diagram is yeah. saying, hey, there's this material, and when I shine this beam on it, if I look at that, the momentum, these peaks, the brightness, the electrons are coming out of that material with preferred directions. Yes. Right? I mean, and so it's, it's telling, you can imagine how something like a Fermi surface is telling you something about how the material, even if you don't know a diagram of how the atoms are bound together, you, a Fermi surface is telling you something about how those atoms are bound together in the surface, right? And a lot are bouncing off this way, and a lot are bouncing off this way. In between, not so much, but interestingly enough, in this one area, one of those bright lines, yeah. you can see electrons are coming out that way. Yeah. So is that a reasonable way yeah. to think about that plot? Thank you so much. Yeah, this is beautiful. I'm going to start talking about it in that way in my future talks. Yeah, exactly. So when you think about, actually, this is exactly what uh, what this image tells us, is that electrons, when they come out of the materials, they don't come out randomly any direction. They have preferred direction in which they, there are more electrons that come out than other directions. And that sort of that that is exactly what these uh, images tell us is is where in the in the in the momentum space or you know electrons here prefer to have a, you know momentum or velocity in that uh, in uh, uh, of of this value, but in here in between the dark regions there are no electrons that like to be there. So actually this is a direct result of really quantum mechanical description of of, of you know electrons on atomic levels. This is, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but your images do not really have the depth information, right? So you don't really know how deep the right. electrons were. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you imagine you also have some depth-dependent uh, uh, technique to really you know, yeah. measure 20 nanometers below the surface, 40 yeah. nanometers below the surface. So this is like a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if in this process, actually, what we're imaging is really the top layer of the material uh, because the electrons, they, you know, if uh, only the top electrons can make it out on the surface. The ones that are, that are deeper uh, below, uh, it takes more um for them to over to overcome this uh, depth to come out to be detected. There are more uh, other techniques like uh, you know playing with the uh, um, photon energy of the light. If you use uh, really high energy uh, X-rays, then you may be able to probe deeper because the electrons have more energy to overcome this um from deeper below. So there are yeah exactly. Thank you yeah. And so those photon energies are in the kilo electron volt? Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. So, so for these uh, archives right. measurements, typically it's on order of um, a few uh, EV to 100 EV oh. is, the, is the range in oh, which we, we, uh, most archives measurements are done, yeah. There are also, uh, there are actually, so these are mm, typical regular RPES. There are also RPES uh, systems that use soft X-ray uh, on the order of like KEV, basically. Yeah, yeah. Those can probe much deeper into the material than yeah. surface. Uh, but those type of material uh, 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 um, uh, measurements are, uh, the energy resolution is not so good because the energy res resolution actually goes to the energy of the photon. So. So they probe different uh, different areas of physics than, than here, but but there are ways to, to go deeper. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. These great questions. So um, the last bit of the talk, I want to actually come back and show you some examples. So I just introduced the technique we use to study these materials, but I want to show you uh, two uh, sort of uh, mini examples of you know the kind of measurements we do and what kind of information we can actually extract out from these measurements uh, based on iron-based materials, so just two topics. Uh, uh, one is, uh, I'll explain what these are when we get there, but one is on electron domesticity, and the other one is why the electron's interaction is actually important for high TC supernovas. So let me just start with that. Uh, so on this previous slide, I only showed like four uh, representative compounds that belong to the iron-based supernovas, but actually, there are many more than just those four, and this is not, you're not supposed to be able to read this uh, because unless you have really good eyesight. Um, so basically, this is like the vertical axis is the transition temperature TC. The horizontal axis is sort of like uh, the data which these compounds were discovered. And you notice that, uh, you know, starting from the initial one around 2006, 2008, even within the first year or so, there were people who were just really uh, working so hard and they, they found 
materials that belong to this family left and right. There were so many different kinds of materials that were discovered with various different kinds of TC, all having in common iron. And this was actually the material basis for which we can work with for the iron-based superconductors is quite large, you know. And um, so as physicists, I think our goal in life is to simplify things, right? We can't really work with, you know, we try always try to extract overarching uh, frameworks in which we can understand things from a simple point of view. How do we, how do we, how in the world do we uh, approach this problem? How do we simplify this and try to have a handle on how to study these? Well, that comes from the crystal structure. So if you take all of those materials and you just look at their crystal structures, a very uh, uh, simple thing comes out, which is that all of them, every single one of them in their crystal structure have this, uh, the, these, these uh, atomic planes uh, where you have iron, so these red balls are, are iron, and then, and then uh, going up and down are uh, other elements like arsenic, selenium, basically if you're chemist, these are nitrogen or tropogen uh, materials on the periodic table. So every single one of these materials have in common, uh, you know, repetitions of these layers. The only difference is that between these layers that are repeated in these uh, materials, there's different kinds of amount of stuff. So you can go from the simplest one, which just have pure iron and selenium layers, to you know these uh, gigantic compounds with all kinds of different kinds of elements. Um, but this tells us one thing: that in order to understand the physics among these materials, the key must be in these uh, layers of iron, uh, iron layers. Right. That is the common, uh, common uh, uh, unifying theme of all of these different kinds of materials. So whatever happens in these materials, the key must lie in these, in these iron plates. So we just have to find uh, information that sort of tells us about uh, these layers. Um, and uh, because of this common layer, actually, uh, these materials have very similar properties. Very similar properties. Uh, uh, so actually, one of the ways we actually can achieve superconductivity in these materials is by, uh, if we consider the charges that are being uh, that are sort of running around in these, in these materials. So this is just an example. If we have this uh, this iron layers, right? Uh, what happens is that the spacer layers are kind of like donating electrons onto the spacer layer. For in order for the materials to superconduct, we must have charges that run around in this layer that can carry electricity, basically, right? So for these materials, the charges come from these uh, these uh, uh, these spacer layers that go into this uh, iron plane. If you actually uh, have a stoichiometric compound, uh, for example, if you look at the resistivity, they do not superconduct. But if you start replacing some of these uh, uh, atoms with other uh, uh, elements uh, that have extra charge carrier, you can really boost TC, right? So this is just in some sort of example uh, where when you start replacing some of these elements with elements that have more, uh, that carry more uh, valence electrons, then you know when you put sufficiently amount of replacement into these layers, then uh, at some at some point you get this uh, characteristic drop in resistivity, which is really telling you that you know here we are superconducting, right? So this process replacing of these elements with elements of, with more valence electrons is called doping. Okay, uh, so doping is one way we can actually achieve superconductivity. So you say, oh, this is really a messy plot. Uh, is there another way to actually look at this plot to, to actually, you know, have some sense of what is going on? So typically, when we uh, uh, a lot of times we, we present this information in what's called a phase diagram. So I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with uh, H2O, and you know that there are three phases, right? There's uh, ice, water, and also air or water vapor. And uh, you, I'm sure you have all seen these plots, and you know that this kind of plot actually tell you that. You know, as a function of pressure, or if you tune temperature, you can actually go from one phase to another. So just by looking at things in this way, we can actually know, you know, under what circumstances these different phases exist, and how we can actually tune from one phase to another. So these are phase diagrams are very useful for really understanding, you know, material properties of any kind of uh, material. So this is what we always do, and it turns out that for all these materials, they all have in common a phase diagram like this. So let me take you through how we actually read this. Uh, in these phase diagrams, the vertical axis is always temperature, where you know here is absolute zero, and this is raising temperature going up. And the horizontal axis in this plot is, again, this concept of doping. So you're introducing valence electrons, 
And on the right hand side, you're sort of putting in more electrons into the system. And the, the further you go from this axis, the more electrons you're putting into the system. And on the other side, you're actually taking out electrons. So when you take out an electron, you actually leave behind what's called holes. So effectively, you think about it, if you take out an electron, then you're sort of leaving behind a positive charge. So holes are like positive charges. They're kind of like the opposite of electrons. So anyway, so 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 it, so by changing, playing with the uh, with the amount of charges in the system, you can see that you can actually go into a phase, the yellow phase, which is when the material uh, becomes superconductive. So this is like a, a very common uh, phase diagram in all of the iron-based materials. And you ask me, what are these different phases? You got red, you got blue. Uh, what are these things? So let me sort of show you what they are. It, um, um, uh, uh, from a crystal point of view. So let's start from the simplest uh, place, which is white. So we call this normal state because nothing happens. It's the most normal phase of this material. And in this normal phase, in this white phase, we have temperatures high enough. If you look at the crystal axis from top down, right? So these red atoms are like iron. Remember the iron plane? So if you look at, from, uh, look at them from top down, uh, in this normal state, um, you got these uh, periodic, uh, you know, arrangement of uh, iron atoms, and um, basically it's a square. So this direction and this direction are the same. It doesn't matter if you rotate the, the, the thing 90 degrees, it will look it's still like this. So this is called tetragonal. It's basically, uh, if you, uh, the, this direction and the x direction and the y direction are exactly the same. And if you start to cool down, eventually you cross a heart line, so this is called a phase boundary. It means that we're entering into a different phase. Remember the, the, the solid water example? So we're now in, in a different phase. But what happens at this, at this boundary? What happens is that uh, this thing becomes squeezed a little bit in this direction and elongated a little bit along that direction. So now you do have a distinction between the x direction and the y direction. It basically goes from a square to a rectangle. And this rectangle uh, structure is called orthorhombic. Right. So now you break so-called rotational C4 symmetry because you cannot just rotate the thing 90 degrees and you have it still the same. So now you have a distinction. Now if you keep going down in temperature, take the same compound, you enter the blue region. What happens in the blue region? What happens, remember, uh, we, earlier we sort of talked about electrons have spins. So like you, they can have spin up, spin down, and so on and so forth. So what happens is very interestingly, when you sort of go down to this blue region, the spins on these, uh, on these crystal uh, lattices actually get arranged. It's such an interesting way that um, they are, these arrows, which is, you know, sort of imagine them as direction of the spins, they are aligned along the shorter direction, and then they're anti-aligned, so every other one gets flipped, you know, uh, out of phase, and then it's anti-aligned along the, the longer direction. So this, uh, this blue phase is so-called a spin density wave, because the spins sort of like make a wave on the lattice. And then if you're at the correct doping, eventually, you know, if you keep going down temperature, then you, your superconductivity appears on top of all of, this, uh, all of this stuff. So it's actually quite interesting because for us, um, if you really think about it, each of these phase transitions breaks a distinct symmetry. And, you know, as physicists, we love symmetry breaking stuff. Uh, because you can imagine even with the same compound, you just cool down and you first break rotational symmetry, and then you cool down further, you break translational symmetry, because, because now the, the unit cell, which is the minimum repeating uh, 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 unit, uh, goes from this size to this size to accommodate the ordering of the spin. And then, you, uh, and then further down, if you go into superintivity, you break what's called gauge symmetry. So it's really interesting, because with just one compound, with one small material, you can actually study how symmetry is broken as you, as, as in this tiny, tiny uh, crystal uh, that you have in your hands. And how physics actually, what kind of interactions are actually driving each of these uh, symmetries to be broken in the same material system. So we decide, you can also, we can learn about the fundamental physics in these materials. <coughs> So the first example, I'm going to sort of tell you what actually we found about this red phase. It's quite interesting. It tells you something very interesting about these uh, interaction of electrons. So let me, let, me, let me do that. So this is our mini outline. I'm going to talk, not talk about this uh, so-called electron dimensity. But don't worry what, what it means. Let me uh, walk you through it. So um, 
For this, I actually have to use a specific crystal structure, uh, which has these uh, iron planes, uh, and then intercalated or with the spacer stuff uh, being barium. And uh, if you only have iron arsenic in this compound, it does not superconduct. It's just boring, boring uh, metal. But if you start to replace some of these iron with cobalt, uh, cobalt sits on the right-hand side of iron, so uh, cobalt actually has extra valence electrons than iron. So by replacing some of these iron with cobalt, we're sort of stuffing more electrons onto this lattice. And as I told you about the process of doping, this process actually is what induces superconductivity in these materials. So but the interesting thing is, um, I, I didn't tell you, so I, I told you that when we cross this first boundary, the lattice sort of breaks from a square to a rectangle, right? But that difference is tiny. So if you look at the you know, period along A and B, the difference is tiny, it's 0.3%, which is a very small effect. So A and B, they, the square becomes just a little bit rectangular, but very small, only 0.3%. But it was a surprise when uh, this group uh, uh, at Stanford, Ian Fisher's group at Stanford, what they found is they were able to measure the electrical resistivity uh, in these materials along the A and B direction. So these three panels sort of show you uh, the measurement is uh, rho, rho is electrical resistivity, and the red is the electrical resistivity if they align, if they, put, uh, they measure their electrical resistivity along the shorter B direction, and the green is when they measure along A. And there is definitely a difference between A and B, but shockingly, um, when they dope a sufficient amount of cobalt, for example, 2.5%, if you replace 2.5% iron with cobalt, you actually get a difference in the resistivity almost a factor of two. So, but it's shocking because the difference between the lattice constants between A and B is only, it's less than 0.3%. But you get a difference in conductivity along two different directions by a factor of two. So that's like 200% versus 0.3%. That's huge, that's a huge difference. That's, that's, that was really shocking to, to, to a lot of us in the field. It sort of suggests that uh, this tiny lattice orthorhombicity cannot really account for the, 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 the difference in electrical resistivity. There must be something else, you know, that's, 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 that's actually driving this. So this, this is the one when we measure the band dispersions with our pets. So the same material, so basically again these are plots, and I'm showing you, uh, so uh, this is the vertical axis is energy, and this is momentum along uh, uh, B direction and A direction, right? And if you follow the color here, that tells you the electronic states that the electrons come out of when we make our, uh, detect our uh, material, the electrons from our material. If, we in the, if we're in the normal state, remember this is when the, the material is it's a square. So in the normal state, uh, the states along this direction, they're mere images of each other, basically. So that, that just another way of saying that, that is that the states along this direction, this direction are degenerate. They're mere images. There's, it tells us that C4 symmetry, rotational symmetry, is respected by the electrons. Fine, not surprising. And from, uh, from our, our measurement, we can also actually tell us, to, to be able to tell what kind of orbitals these states are from. So in that sense, uh, we, we were able to tell that these states along X were actually coming from X, uh, Y, Z orbitals, and the other direction is X, Z orbitals. The surprise was when we cooled down into, into the orthorhombic phase, we, we observe directly that the states on this direction and along this direction are actually quite different. So these bands are actually shifted up and these bands are actually shifted down. In the sense that if you actually now calculate the difference in energy of these states, it's on the order of 80 MeV milli electron volts. But what is 80 MeV, again, what is, what, compared to what? Is it big or small? How do we actually think about this? So the way that we thought about this is that we can sort of estimate the amount of difference 0.3% lattice would make um, you know, in, this, in this problem by doing a calculation. And it shows us that if we only input this 0.3% lattice uh, difference, that can at most give us a difference of the bands of, of 10 MeV, which is almost an order of magnitude smaller than we actually observe. That's shocking. What does that mean? It means that uh, if you consider the actions of the lattice, that is actually gigantic uh, in the crystal, right? <laughs> the electrons are tiny, and they're just sort of uh, traveling around on the lattice. The lattice is very big. But the lattice is only responsible, can only really be responsible for about uh, uh, a very small change. Uh, but the electron response is much, much greater. 
So it's actually quite interesting to think about because it tells us that the behaviors of the electrons are much greater than the behavior of the lattice. That's actually surprising because to the electrons, the lattice are like mountains, right? They are huge, and it's really hard to move them. But uh, when the electrons are actually interacting with each other, they're working together, they actually drive a symmetry breaking effect in the material, which then drives this uh, underlying lattice. So the electrons, even though they're small, but because they're interacting so much, they can actually drive a change in the underlying lattice. That's, that's, uh, that's really an a emergent phenomenon. So uh, this is, I'm almost done. So this is a pneumatic phase. So pneumatic just means that it's defined by broken rotational C4 symmetry. So if you have you know, C2 symmetry, uh, that's pneumatic. And electronic, because we know that this is not driven by lattice, but um, it's driven by the electronic degrees of freedom. So this, is, this, is, uh, uh, this turned out to be actually a dominant effect over a large uh, area portion of the phase diagram in many iron-based materials. And this actually uh, may provide uh, some, of, uh, some uh, enhancement of why the TC may be high in these materials. So uh, my time is up, so I'm going to skip the second example. Uh, just go directly to the concluding, concluding slide. Um, so I sort of give you a taste of, uh, I think, uh, what, it, what, what we mean by unconventional superconductivity. Basically, materials that we don't understand, superconductors that we don't yet understand. Our goal is to really raise TC, and in order to do that, we need to first understand why, how the electrons are actually interacting on these lattices to really understand why they bound together into pairs to, to, to provide superconductivity. Uh, super and then I sort of tell, told you a little bit about the technique of ARPES and how that can actually help us to study uh, these electronic fingerprints in these solids. And uh, I didn't have time for the second one, but I showed you a little bit of how we actually extract information from these measurements to sort of learn a little bit about superconductivity. So, uh, and uh, none of this would have been possible without collaboration. So uh, for us, uh, collaboration is really a major component of our work. And we were fortunate enough to work with many, many uh, um, wonderful people in the field. So I'm not going to read them all, but uh, just to give you a sense. And uh, thank you very much. That being said, let's start with questions. Yes. Uh, your TC so far is about like a 60, 70 Kelvin. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on something uh, the highest of TC, obviously, it's about beyond yeah, yeah. the Kelvin. So, what, what is the, the, you know, the, the size of TC people can get these data? Yeah, so uh, recently, a couple of years ago, I, people were, uh, I didn't have, how many, maybe I have this plot. I cut this out. Yeah, um, uh, the highest record right now uh, is this. No. Sorry. Uh, the highest record is actually uh, hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide. So they recently, people a couple of years ago, it was really exciting because uh, this is really like this is like this stuff is like a gas that makes eggs smell bad. You know the stuff that makes eggs that, that rotten smell. This is that stuff. So these these uh, these uh, physicists, these uh, scientists from uh, Russia, they were able to actually compress that down and solidify this thing under like 90 gigapascal of a pressure. So they were able to achieve that kind of, so this is the kind of pressure that, that happens in our crust of our earth basically. And they were able to solidify this uh, rotten smell uh, into something that actually superconducts at minus 70 uh, Celsius. So that's the current um, um, record. I mean, you can imagine this kind of thing, is, it's hard to make an application out of it <laughs> uh, right now. But um, uh, it was at least there are people. There are things people are trying to boost, and uh, the hope is that uh, we will be able to predict uh, how, where we can actually find materials that with high TC. But the uh, honest answer is that everything, every time it's been an accident, basically, <laughs> more or less. Uh, people are working on different things, and they realize this this thing actually is superman. So I don't know when the next one will be, whether it will be predicted or um, or or an accident, um, but. Um, yeah, so the current record is um, minus 70, which is perhaps room temperature in some parts of the Earth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what's missing is really a theory, a theory yeah. that can really tell you. So right now it's really try, you know, just try something, yeah. if it works great, if it doesn't, you know, make something else. Yeah. And the regular one can really get up to like 150 Kelvin. So, I mean, yeah. that does really need a high pressure. Right, right, right. So, right. May I follow up on that just briefly? 
because there was when we got the BCS theory, right? Yeah. Uh, um, did that was that really key to those those the new superconductiver? Was that I mean, it's not an explanation of it, but was that theoretical understanding the thing that helped? find a new set of superconductors, or was it kind of or orthogonal? Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was not orthogonal, it was the opposite. So based on everything people, uh, people have learned about conventional superconductors, actually there were a set of rules that were guidelines for how you can find higher other superconductors. And, uh, and it was like, you must find the most symmetric, like cubic, uh, cubic uh, crystal structure, stay away from magnetism, and there were you know, various rules. But these uh, group rates were opposite uh, per, pay, pretty much every single rule. So it's layered material and it's smack close to magnetic order. So like all the rules that theorists came out of with the conventional ones actually were not helped. They might have hindered the development. <laughs> <laughs> and so people said there's like one more rule which is to stay away from theorists. I don't know. So <laughs> I wouldn't say that. So I mean, we get a lot of help. Yeah, so, so You've heard it said. It's, okay. it's, yeah. not, it's not just yeah. safe. <laughs> Yeah, but some yeah. people say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it looks like there is a there is a correlation between the physical dimension of the lattice in one direction uh -huh. and the superconductivity. Uh -huh. Has there been has there been any study on uh, physically compressing a single crystal to see the you know, stuff temperature after by, by compression, very high pressure? Yeah, this is a great question. I was actually going to talk about this in the second part. But anyway, uh, so yeah, the structure, uh, at least for the iron-based materials, the structure actually does play a role with TC. So like, um, I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh, so so basically, uh, what people found was that um, let me find the crystal structure. So uh, uh, actually, how how high this this these uh, these things are from the iron plane has a direct relation with TC. So people actually found there's like optimal uh, height uh, that um, you know uh, of, of these nictogen height, basically the distance from these things to the iron plane that actually directly relates with TC. There's an optimal uh, 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 value uh, uh, that's the best for TC. If it's too short or too high. Uh, the TC gets lower. So, so yes. So that's great. This is, yeah. Has anyone mean? done any study on actually physically uh, uh, pressurizing? Uh, just, because just because just yeah. 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 pascals with the hydrogen sulfide. Well, well, but that's the gas. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. So so there. So I only introduced one axis in which superconductivity emerges, which is doping. Actually, another very common one is pressure. So people have seen like in some materials, some of these iron-based materials. Uh, even though the initial TC is very low, but if you really put it under a lot of pressure, TC actually gets enhanced. So uh, pressure is another uh, tuning knob for in inducing TC in these materials. Yeah, so right, yeah. I think it's a follow-up on this, but yeah. B and A are in plane with the iron, yeah. and, the, and the distance you're talking about um, in separation was the arsenic or selenium yeah. up and down yeah. Z-axis yeah. right. or something. Okay. Right, right, right. Right, yeah. Yes, it's just a follow-up on your question. Yeah. The pressure experiment is actually quite a popular in, in the, even in the BCS theory. In the sense that silicon, for example, is not a superconductor if you don't put a pressure. So a lot of metals or uh, semi-metals or even semiconductors, they are not really semi uh, superconductors unless you put a, a pressure in a certain direction. Uh, and there's an enhancement that was also observed if you do apply the pressure in one direction. But, but you can create um, superconductivity just by, you know, by high pressure enough. Well, you can. I'm just like I said, a silicon, for example, is yeah. uh, a material. If you just put the pressure into the material, it does become a superconductor. Yeah. yeah. So, at least according to this, though, uh, green elements become superconducting only under pressure. So, some elements yeah, have this tendency. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've kind of had this random question because, like, 
because like superconductivity, as you've just demonstrated, it has emerges in all of these exotic phases of matter or crystalline yeah. structure, yeah. and even as you said, H2S gas. So it's like, and you say it's an emergent property. So it has so that, like all these yeah. interacting factors can contribute to the generation of superconductivity. Yeah. So you get so it, am I thinking is this, this that you have yeah, that since we don't have a theory, yeah. we don't have a nice unified theory. There's this you have to search this giant parameter space, yeah. poking holes in each of these different neighborhoods, hoping that like maybe it'll be superconductive, yeah. and. What kind of structure does that primary space look like? I know we can't visualize it, yeah. a cross section of it. If we could even get a cross section, it'd be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, this is really interesting because uh, nowadays there's really like all these funny agencies really pushing for like large data uh, driven uh, ways to search for materials with exotic uh, properties. So like, yeah, so this is a good question. What kind of materials may, may so currently what we know is based on this, uh, mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, based on this, uh, uh, this, yeah, based on this sort of thing, we know that uh, actually, uh, so these two families and some other unconventional smiters uh, all emerge, as you said, in this uh, really close to magnetic order, mm -hmm. um, which is not true. So another difference, uh, which is not true for conventional ones. So another difference between conventional and unconventional material uh, smiters is that uh, if you think about phase diagram for these materials is very simple. There's really not much to it. But for these materials, the unconventional ones, the phase diagrams are very complex. Uh, and most of these materials uh, have a parent compound or the stoichiometric uh, uh, phase being magnetic order. Yeah. So, right, so we're sort of maybe, maybe thinking like maybe we should look close to magnetic, magnetic orders uh, to look for some activity. But, yeah. And then because the, you, you showed us doping, that we could yeah. change things strongly by just even like mild amounts of doping. Yeah. So it's like, would, it be, there, would there be enough like sensitivity that we might actually get like a kind of almost fractal phase diagram for some of these connectors? Like, oh, this yeah. material will be like superconductor, but like if we even dope just a little bit over, it will stop being superconducting. Yeah, I'm like, that's a great question. So um, maybe you will find out. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, this is a great question. So, I think right now uh, the way like sort of field is that we really lack like a, a comprehensive theoretical model to take into uh, to really that can really uh, describe all the phenomena that we see in these very complex materials. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah maybe so so we don't know. I, uh, there are predictions from different kinds of theories, but. We also have to work experimentally on where, um, you know, uh, so it's like a, we're sort of working side by side. Yes. Uh, we get some uh, experimental operations and then we talk to the theorists who like, uh, you know, maybe come up with some explanation for what we see and have some sort of prediction and then we look further in, into those directions on whether we can improve TC or understand the pairing mechanism. And, and, then they, and then we get more evidence and they, 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 you know, they sort of modify their model to, to see if they can explain these new phenomena. So it's, it's kind of like a step-by-step -step, step, uh, uh, collaboration. And, yeah, we're, so right now, just we haven't, we haven't really, there's really no full theory framework that can describe all of the interesting phenomena yet. But yeah, very, very interesting question. Yeah. It's um, probably a last question. Yeah. Okay. Great talk, by the way. So you said something at the beginning that really uh, perked my ears up. If I understood you correctly, you said to start your research investigation, you needed to know both the position and momentum yeah. of electrons. Yeah. Which I immediately thought, well, that violates the Heisenberg yeah. uncertainty yeah. principle. So yeah. is there something about the lattice work that allows you to investigate both of those um, yeah. phenomena at the same time? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I guess we cannot really say we know the lo location, exact location of the electrons. They exist in probability clouds and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, today, I only really talk about our technique, which is ARPES, but that actually, uh, uh, there's a whole suite of uh, different experimental techniques developed for studying these problems and actually we need results from all these different techniques to really understand the elephant in the room, so to speak. So there are techniques like, um, for example, scanning tunneling microscopy, which really looks at the real space, so like uh, real space information on these materials. Whether superconductivity is a uniform uh, phenomenon across, you know, uh, different regions or if it's a separated. So, so uh, so there are different tools for looking at different uh, uh, aspects of this. Now for us, that was that was by attempt at trying to introduce momentum space being analogous to, to real space. But I don't mean that we can actually know both information some things together. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, if, really if I can make one question, or I've been kind of waiting, is that the momentum space and the spin coupling seems to be where it is it, and you can define the movement of these very small things. And, and she, the pictures of the coupling, when the vortexes are going uh -huh. in opposite uh -huh. spins, yeah. the electrons are free to move uh, through them. Yeah. So when the gears are in mesh, then they, then they're free to travel. If they're grinding, not so much. Yeah. So right. So so right. So we're so we really take our results and compare with other techniques and try to find a coherent uh, picture of this giant elephant we have. We're trying to figure out. Yeah. Great. Let's take this.